Hello and welcome to the first fully IB unit. Yes, we are getting away from the Virginia SOLs and focusing down on the IB content and skills that you need to know both for your life and for that test that you're going to take eventually. This unit is on peacemaking the... and peacekeeping in the interwar period, and we're going to start with the beginning of that period, the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. In this presentation, we're going to examine the aims of the peacemakers and Wilson's 14 points. Now, we're going to add a new layer of understanding to these videos. And basically, you're going to go through this process where you read the section, and then you watch the video, and then you annotate the reading as we're going through the video, and then you fill out the guide. So you're doing multiple things, and I realize that's a lot, but um, Ms. Beatty and I are pushing you guys into deeper ways of thinking that will be immensely helpful to you as responsible citizens in a democratic republic, and will also be useful on your IB exams. So, Let's review what the causes of World War I were so you can keep those in mind as we talk about the peace process. The peacemakers, Wilson in particular, were focused on addressing these causes so that war would not break out again. So nationalism, if you remember, it was a nationalist Serbian who assassinated the Archduke Ferdinand. Um, so definitely there's a direct cause there, a link. But nationalism also blinded a lot of people to the sort of mutual aspects of peacekeeping where... Um, your own nation's interest isn't the only thing you need to consider when considering going to war. Imperialism and the competition for colonies and competition over limited natural resources was a cause. Uh, the alliances in particular dragged multiple countries into the war. And the issue of secret treaties here was a big deal, where if you had a treaty with one country and the other countries were unsure if you had treaties with other countries, and Italy had a secret treaty with um, Great Britain and France, which led it into World War I on the side of the Entente powers, even though it was technically allied otherwise with Germany. Um, militarism and the sort of militaristic response to uh, the major crises leading up to World War I and that also links then into the diplomatic failures, basically that instead of responding with some sort of diplomatic solution, the general response was, oh, you'd like to go to war? Well, I have big guns and we shall go to war now. We are fine warlike gentlemen. And I do mean men. So, some background on the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, world War I had already technically ended, as most historians would say, because there were armistices in late 1918. And an armistice is like a truce. Um, it's an agreement to stop fighting for a certain period of time, but generally armistices uh, last longer. Um, the major powers that were defeated in World War I included Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria. And outside of these powers that we mentioned, there are lots of other ones, but these are the primary ones. So victorious powers included France, Great Britain, Italy, the United States, Japan, and Serbia. So I've got my fingers in there. So where did it take place? Well, it took place in Paris, France, and the suburbs surrounding Paris. Um, it took place on January 18th, 1919. That was when it began. And then it went all the way up through 1920 for the various different treaties. Um, so the what and the why of this, it was a meeting of the Allied powers to design a treaty that would end World War I. And different countries and representatives had differing objectives. Um, and it included the representatives of various nations. That's important to remember. There were individual people who were representing whole nations at a peace conference. Um, so we're going to talk a lot in this unit about what just means and what a peace is. Um, notice I've used those air quotes, those problematic quotes, um, at the beginning of this. Now, the first question we're going to sort of ask is, are the decisions taken by these people moral? As in, does it follow their own codes, um, their own sort of sense of justice? Uh, but also we have to consider, is it ethical? Like, does it follow society's code of what just is? But then also, when you're making a peace, you have to consider multiple parties that are involved. And so you have to say, whose code are we talking about? Whose individual codes matter? And then what society are we talking about? Whose ethical systems matter? Um, but beyond that, what's interesting is that you can also look at what measurable effects various elements of a peace agreement will have on the people involved. And you can sort of make somewhat scientific or objective uh, measurements of how it will affect people. And that's a big deal too. Notice in the picture right here, by the way, you've got 
this ethics here pointing to the area around this person and morality pointing, I think, to the heart. So ethics is the stuff that's around you, that's put on you, moral systems that society puts on you, and morality comes from this sort of inborn sense of what is right and what is wrong. So in order to examine the peacemaking and peacekeeping element of this, first we're going to look at Woodrow Wilson, because he's one of the core figures. Now he lived from 1856 until 1924, so he lived through a lot of really fascinating history, especially American history. Um, he was an academic, he was the president of Princeton, uh, which is a pretty big deal, and he eventually went into politics and became a progressive politician. Uh, he also held to a lot of neutralist or pacifist policies, keeping the United States out of World War I. Um, he was the president from 1913 until 1921. Uh, he is the sort of founder, at least the main brain behind the League of Nations. And he leaves a complicated legacy, because although he had neutralist policies, um, perhaps someone might say isolationist, we did also invade Haiti in 1915. That's a thing that happened. Also, he resegregated the White House, and he also resisted women's suffrage for a long time. So, whenever we talk about him, he's commonly thrown out as this, like, heroic figure, but I think it's important to remember the elements of his life that we would look back on now and not see as so heroic, even for his own time. So, we're going to annotate now the 14 points. So, whenever you annotate something in IB, you want to look first at its origin. Always just stop yourself. Where to come from? Now, this came from, it's an address that uh, Wilson gave to Congress on January 8th, 1919. And note, that's before the war ended. The armistices came in the latter half of 1918. So, Wilson had asked a committee called the Inquiry to come up with some recommendations based on a huge ton of research about uh, international relations and economics and just lots of things. Um, so they, he asked them to write this report to actually help him come up with this address that he wanted to give to Congress. So why did he want to give that address in the first place? Well, it was to reassure Americans that the war had noble purposes. Take note of that. Um, and he wanted to set the tone for peace negotiations, which he knew were in the works. Um, he also wanted to set out a program that would embody his vision of international cooperation, as in he wanted to get the sort of idea of a League of Nations in there early. Now you have to stop yourself and go, wait, wait, why am I analyzing this? I know where it came from and what its purpose was, but uh, what is my purpose as a historian? And we are studying this in order to study the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. So that has particular implications, things that it means for us as we're going further here. So let's stop now to annotate what exactly does it say. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to take a look at Wilson's 14 points. Again, this is on 21. It's source A. And I want you to underline all the points that contain ideas of self-determination. Now, self-determination is the idea that nations, as in people of a particular nationality, should be allowed to form political bodies, as in nation states, by themselves. They should have the ability to decide if they want to have their own nation or be part of some other nation. That's the idea of self-determination. So look through those points and try and find where you see self-determination in there. You can pause now. Good. So, you're back. We'll talk more about that in class, and that'll be definitely on your quiz, and you'll see it there in your study guide. So, its value. Um, it was used extensively by Wilson in the negotiations with France and Great Britain, so it's valuable to us if we're studying the conferences, because it gives us a window into Wilson's strategy and his goals at those conferences. Um, now, the leaders of France and Great Britain had read it, and they agreed to it with some limits. You see that document a little further on in your textbook. Uh, so we can compare the limits that they state in their response to the final peace treaty and go like, okay, were they being entirely truthful? Did they actually push for more in that uh, conference? Are there little like secret needs and goals for those countries? Or are they pretty well laid out in public? Um, and Wilson and his committee believed that this was a good cause, uh, case for a just war. So we get some idea 
of what a just war meant to Americans, or at least to their political leaders who um, and people who were involved in politics, we can get a sense of who, what they thought a just war was. And that's an incredibly important insight for the American aims within the peace conferences. So how is it limited, though? We also have to ask ourselves that. Um, it's only the American vision of what is just. So that does not give us a sense of any of the other people involved. So it's a single point of view. But that's normal for a particular document. It's weird to have uh, a huge number of points of view well represented. Uh, it's a public view of Wilson's aims. So we don't get uh, a window into his private thoughts here if we're trying to consider Wilson's role. Um, and it's politicized. It's an address given to Congress. So it is formed and shaped by Wilson's political considerations as much as his own beliefs and the beliefs and goals that he takes with him to Versailles. Um, so now turn to page 22, and we're going to examine this political cartoon. When you're looking at a political cartoon, the first thing you should do is get a first impression. So uh, while my eyes are drawn first to the figure there, um, he's the sort of best well-drawn, I'm assuming it's a he, uh, now, my eyes are drawn next to that bubble that has League of Nations written in it, and it seems to be coming from that pipe. Uh, and, oh, so it's like a bubble pipe, and it's coming from that, that bowl down there. And that bowl has idealism written on it. Okay. So, I've actually, it's kind of funny that he has a bubble pipe. I didn't know those existed back then. So, let's talk about the sort of origin and purpose and audience. And you'll see that in your book there, it says that it was a cartoon published in Literary Digest, September 1920. So Literary Digest, that could be British, that could be American, probably American if it's about the president, but you actually don't know. He's an international dude. Uh, so, okay, I've already kind of given it away. Like, there's Woodrow Wilson in there. Um, that's sort of a quintessential picture of him, and it definitely already says that in your book, so it's been given away to you as well. Um, but what's the purpose of it? We might not be able to totally get that until we talk about what the figures and symbols and message are, but we can at least look at the audience. And if it's an American thing called the Literary Digest, uh, that sounds like it might be sort of a more intellectual, upper class uh, kind of publication. And so its audience might be targeted at people who are following these international events um, with interest and have a sense of uh, the academic view of what the peace conferences are about. So you see how I did that? I went from what it was published in to talk about the audience, but also it's a political cartoon, so it's more accessible to a wider audience and generally targeted at a wider audience than a really in-depth analysis piece is. So, and probably an American audience. It's written in English. That's a big deal. Uh, let's identify some of the figures. Well, Woodrow Wilson... He is the figure in this one. And he's right there. Let's identify the symbols. And I'm actually going to head over to MS Paint to sort of outline these things. So let's do Woodrow Wilson right there. And he's got a, a pipe. This is a, a big bubble. League of Nations is written on that bubble. You got some other little bubbles over here. You got this bowl down here that says idealism. Um, and I know that with a bubble pipe, you sort of like dip it in bubbles and you blow into it and it blows a big bubble. Um, so here are the major symbols. So what's interesting or important about it being a bubble? Well, I think there's a connection here between, uh, you know, idealism being this, you know, really great ideas, but maybe they're not so sound or they don't work out in real life. And when you're blowing bubbles, that's actually an old expression, but you might not know that. But you can at least know that bubbles are fragile, right? So they're likely to burst. And from your own knowledge of this, Woodrow Wilson is blowing up some idealistic view of the world, and then um, the League of Nations is perhaps likely to burst. So that, you know, we've worked now with some of these symbols. So it's definitely coming from him. So it's identifying him as the originator of this idea, too. But that it's coming out of his bowl of idealism, perhaps. So... Let's go back and ask ourselves, what now is the message? We sort of already talked about that, because when you start to look at the symbols and you put meaning to those symbols, you can start to get at the message. So what is the message of this uh, political cartoon? Well, perhaps that Woodrow Wilson's idea of the League of Nations is idealistic, that it is not well-grounded in reality and dangerously 
going to burst, perhaps, and not work out. Uh, so this is a very political view, especially because during this time, and this is important context for this, in the United States, the Senate was voting whether or not to ratify the Treaty of Versailles and include the United States in the League of Nations. And Wilson was pushing for that really hard, and there were senators who were really, really against it. So... Once you know the context and the purpose and the message and the symbols, now you've analyzed it to the point where you have a good understanding of what this political cartoon is about. And uh, that's what you need to be able to do in IB. So this is the third kind of annotation I'm going to have you do. We annotated a primary source text that was uh, Wilson's 14 points. We annotated a political cartoon. But now we're going to do an annotation, and this is reading against a text. That is, when you're reading something, but you're actively trying to find ways to disagree with it. And this is a really important skill. So you're reading against the textbook, uh, which I think is always important, um, because the problem with this textbook and many books like it is that it does a lot of simplifying and single point giving, and it pretends like it is a, uh, an objective or biasless view. But here's a major issue with it that you guys are going to work with through annotation. This book personifies nations, and that's a problem, because nations are complicated things, especially in this period of time, um, because the modern idea of a nation had only been around for maybe a century, maybe a couple of centuries, and the idea of what a nation was had changed substantially during that time, and nation, uh, nationalism had been a major cause of World War I. So it's all wrapped up in this discussion, and they simplify it to the point that's kind of dangerous. Um, because what they do is they give a nation a single set of motives and goals and a single identity in a way that doesn't really reflect what the past was like. And that's always a problem, as you know, with history, trying to write and get close to what the past was like so you can analyze it in a way that gets at little t truth, little truths. Um, so in this case, the problem with nations is first that when they talk about nations in the textbook, they sometimes mean the leaders of those nations, and they have like three levels of ideas here. They can have their own ideas on morals for the peace conference, they can have their own ideas um, on ethics for the peace conference, and then they are always considering the politics of their nation, because they're elected leaders and they want to get elected again, or perhaps need to get elected again. So their ideas and their goals are wrapped up in these three major pieces, uh, like ways of looking at them, and when they just put it over here like it's the, just the leaders and we're calling it the nation, that's really problematic because it doesn't go deep enough. But then also when you talk about a nation as in the whole collective group of everyone who lives within a particular geographical boundary, um, the average pe person in that nation, you're ignoring a huge amount of diversity. And I have this puzzle up here to represent that. Now, even within a geographical boundary, you could identify as a different nationality, be from a different place, or consider yourself as part of a sub-nationality, like the um, Basque group in Spain, or uh, within sort of the countries which they created, like Czechoslovakia, um, had multiple different nationalities, like German, Czech, uh, that sort of thing. But also, within a single nation, you have a huge amount of diversity in religion, ethnicity, language, perspectives, experiences, race, culture, um, job level, so socioeconomic status, age, sexual orientation, although they didn't really consider that much at this time. Um, so that kind of diversity would really change someone's point of view, especially on huge issues like how to achieve a just peace. So what I want you to do is go through and annotate as an underline every time this textbook uh, personifies and oversimplifies this issue of the aims, goals, and beliefs of a nation. Good luck. Have fun.